But first, let's talk infrastructure. Um, let's talk cloud computing infrastructure. So once upon a time, cloud computing. How was life, uh, let's say DevOps life, before the cloud? Uh, well, first, we had to manage bare metal servers. Uh, I hope not again you can see uh, on this picture. Uh, apparently some did. Um, so servers. They were awesome toys. Uh, we could play with them, touch them, and mount them, clean them, do whatever we want with them. But we must admit that they were inconvenient. Uh, and this for several reasons, which uh, put all together, make them actually really inconvenient. Uh, they were big, heavy, noisy, and more particularly costly. Hardware maintenance. Uh, remember that this that just failed and you had to replace um, the memory chip silently making your infrastructures being slower and slower, a network card failing and causing disconnections, uh, electrical cost, and that one could be a big one, storage place, the time to set up them. Well, put all together and all those solutions existed and still exist to ensure reliability and redundancy is the key here. Uh, at the end of the month, the bill was often a bit spicy. Some providers were proposing uh, to rent their own servers. And they were bare metal servers you could rent mostly annually, uh, but look at it on remote data centers. That was the first step, helping companies, uh, but also individuals, uh, to stop worrying about hardware issues. But it seems it wasn't enough, as many companies still prefer to manage their own infrastructures themselves, especially when in need of more power. Anyway, software companies still had to manage hardware infrastructures and we need a solution. Thanks to projects like OpenStack, uh, the first IES movements happened in the late 2000s. What does infrastructures as a service for IES uh, means? It means that the infrastructure you before had to manage in your office or data center for the best of us uh, is no providers. They deal with the hardware issues and let us, CSAN means developers or even entrepreneurs, focus on what matters and easily deploy virtual machines on their infrastructures. Uh, we will see later why the notion of what matters is important and how we can be reduced. So, which kind of problem the IA solved? Well, pretty much all the ones listed before. By grouping the hardware all together, the first thing IAS succeeds to do is to dramatically reduce the general maintenance cost. Does it mean you, as a company, pay less at the end of the month? Yes. Does it mean you don't have to worry about hardware issues again? Well, generally and again, yes. So, reduce cost and easier management. What else? Scaling. Auto-scaling. One of the revolutions of IAS was the ability to start a cluster of machines able to scale anytime it is needed. Again, other scaling implies reduced cost. What else? Well, there is one thing important to mention here. When speaking about the cloud and IAS, there is often a confusion between VPS and actual IAS. IAS platforms are in fact more than simple virtual machine instances available on demand. The cloud comports as well a multitude of services like databases, data warehouse, message queues, policy management, and so on, helping to build the more efficient infrastructures with dedicated and precise tools. That could be very complicated to set up otherwise. In other words, IES improved the general efficiency of infrastructures and what a breeze. But did it necessarily make it more simple? Well, it depends how you are looking at it. Um, it definitely made it simpler for some CSI means who had to do the hardware maintenance themselves. Uh, Sometimes go to the data center, plug the machine together, change failing components, and so on. Uh, I myself had to do it. Uh, it's fun the first times, but you quickly end up making dreams of putting cables all together at night. Um, anyway, um, it has also made it easier by providing a more and more complex set of tools, helping devs and ops to build an efficient structure. I'm thinking here about the services I was talking before, like uh, those helping you to manage message queues, or helping with databases, big data, and so on. So yes, easier in some ways, but 
even with the tool I just mentioned, there is one thing it didn't really help for, is software configuration. Um, we're actually all involved in that. Uh, devs, ofs, you, me, we all have to configure servers, and this whether it is an OpenStack instance or a bare metal server. You may think there is another problem IAS did not solve, what we call the deployment automation. On standard IAS solution, it is pretty much as painful to develop a new version of our product to production than a traditional server, and it can very quickly become a problem. Today, at the era of SAS services, where people can make up to multiple deployments a day. But each problem has a solution, and that's what products like Puppet, Chef, Salt, and Sybil, among others, uh, did. This product actually existed before the cloud, and they make it way easier for us to configure and deploy our services. The principle is quite simple. You first deploy an agent on each server you would like to configure, and then push the configuration you want on this machine via a master server. At the first look, the main advantages here will be the possibility to script the entire server's configuration, but also deploy in bulk your servers. But one thing this solution is really did better is the ability to manage and update the configurations. States, as some call the step of the configuration, should be, by concepts, in importance. In that way, the configuration management services doesn't try to ensure whether a command line has been executed, or if, but if an action is in the current state. In other words, instead of saying install this software, you say something like ensure this software in present in the latest version. It has the major advantage to ensure your machines are always up to date and work correctly. Some other products more cloud oriented like VisualOps uh, or OpsWorks are more focused on the cloud ecosystem and let you automate your deployments. But did this product really make things easier? I would personally try to say yes, but some could argue as they can be sometimes complicated to use, asking to really change your habits and behaviors. This is exactly where PIS was born for platform as a service, which is another kind of, uh, of cloud computing. Simplicity. After all, that's all we want. PAS solved many problems by being much more simple to use than uh, AAS. PAS platforms provide an easy way to quickly automate application deployments. On platforms like Heroku, for example, a simple git push let you deploy a new version of your app within seconds. But with PAS, simplicity at the cost. Yes, it is simple, but do we know how it works? PAS is probably adapted for early startups and entrepreneurs who don't want to spend time on infrastructures, but when more specific needs are coming, is it possible to deploy them via a PAS platform? PAS are limited to the technology they support, and it is a limitation for many applications. At the same time, PAS is commonly defined as black box platform. We don't know how it works. We don't know how resources are shared, how stable they are, if they are secure enough, and so on. Is there any solution for easy, reliable, fast, and automated platform? Well, containers, here we are, finally. Uh, yeah, this is exactly where it came out. Containers represent applications. In fact, they are not as young as we make them only think. Containers are not concepts um, that we can see in implementations like FreeBSD jails or solar resistance. But these were focused on isolations and mostly security. It's a necessary use case, and we will see later why, but not the one we were actually looking for making the switch. Today, with Docker's implementation, they are portable, secure, simple, shareable. Both developers and sysadmin can manage the same containers, and the IDBN containers is as simple as what is working on your developer machine will work on the same way on the production services. Wow. But even if on the paper containers look awesome, a question subsists. What to do with them? They can be deployed on the existing platforms. Obviously need to spend time working on containers deployment automations. Um, are we back to the original problem? Not exactly. 
Conscious containers were becoming more and more popular, cloud providers started to build the first CAS platforms. So what is a CAS platform? Um, today, as it is proposed with projects like Magnum and Nova and OpenStack, for example, a container as a service platform, even if it's not often called that way, uh, is an IAS platform with an integrated ability to deploy containers on them. First, you start to build a cluster of virtual machines. Once this cluster is deployed and configured, a container management service is set up on them. This service lets you then schedule your containers on the build cluster. As you can see here, we first have a group of servers. On these servers, we have a cluster of virtual machines. Then each virtual machine is able to schedule containers. This infrastructure is actually a nice innovation and could even tend to a custom PIS or white boss PIS, uh, where you could easily start and automate application containers while still knowing what's running on your infrastructures and not being limited to a few technologies. But don't you see a problem with this approach? Doesn't it sound heavy to you or hacky? There are actually a few downsides of that way to manage containers. First, from the beginning, you, as the user, need to create a cluster of virtual machines. It's not really the way containers were supposed to run. Containers were made to be an additional layer on top of virtual machine images. Then you need to configure this cluster. Operating systems need to be configured, and even if most of it can be scripted or automated, there is still some work at this level. Also, virtualized operating systems are heavy. It's probably transparent to most of users like us, but from the cloud provider's perspective, it can result in waste of resources and overall higher cost. We have, during a long time, tried to figure out which part of this system had to change. And we found that the main responsible of the problem as previously stated was nothing else than the virtualized operating system itself. When you think about it, virtual machines either require a layer as ensuring an isolation between different applications. But is the operating system necessary when running containers? Well, no. You only need a kernel. Libraries and programs have already moved to the containers. So instead, you can now imagine it implemented that way. Virtual machines are scheduled on the go, directly on the bare metal servers. And a group of containers images is able to run on each virtual machine. There are a lot of advantages coming from this architecture. The main is to reduce the overhead containers on top of IAS was introducing, which involve both higher performances and improved flexibility. Indeed, no more configuration on your virtual machines. No more fixed size for each cluster. Virtual machines are created on the go according to the needs of each applications required at that time. So this is exactly the kind of ID hyper implements. First, a diamond is running on your bare metal servers. Then, this diamond is able to run on demand a virtual machine in a fraction of seconds, like 200, 300 milliseconds. This virtual machine is only composed by an optimized Linux kernel and what we can call here a container init process. This container in it process, uh, that we call hyperstart, is able to communicate with the native daemon and schedule container images on the virtual machine. Hyper is what we call a hypervisor agnostic container runtime. The main component of Hyper is called HyperD, which is able to directly run on bare metal servers and is manageable through a REST API or CLI tool. HyperD is the one able to run virtual machines on the moon within less than a second. These virtual machines only consist of an optimized Linux kernel and a container init process called HyperStart, uh, able to receive instructions from HyperD. Container images are simply extracted and launched on the created virtual machines per application. We call this group of virtual machines and containers pods. This approach has the advantage of delivering much higher performances and efficiency than the CIS on IAS we saw before, but with its level of security and isolations for multi-tenant applications. We have seen a lot of people 
trying to compare and dissociate containers and virtual machines. And we thought, would it be possible to just take the best of both worlds and bring containers flexibility to the isolations of virtual machines? We concluded it was actually possible, and this is what Hyper is all about. Hyper lets you run your Docker images as virtual machines, with a workflow as convenient as you can have with Docker. As you can see here, Hyper managed to take the best of both virtualization and containers world. By letting you build the isolated application-centric cloud we all want, we believe this approach can solve most of today's concerns and aligns with the continuous revolution already happening in the cloud. Thanks a lot for your interest in this really exciting new technology. If you would like to learn more about Hyper, you can visit its official website here. Hyper is open source and we warmly welcome contributions. You can check out our GitHub for more details. The address is on the official page. There is also our official Slack community and Twitter, both links are also on the homepage. About me, my name is Thibaut Bronchamp. I am Hyper's Developers Ambassador, and you can follow me on Twitter using the handle written here. Thank you.